All right, we are recording. Good evening, everybody. I hope you are all doing well tonight. We are just about a minute away from starting our third community meeting for the city of Reno's uh, redistricting process. So we are just going to give it a minute and let uh, folks log in. Um, so we will get started here very shortly. Thanks so much for joining us. All right, well, my clock says 530, so we appreciate everybody joining us tonight. Good evening and thank you. Uh, this is the third community meeting uh, for the city of Reno's redistricting process before we transition into the formal adoption process with the Reno City Council. I'm Callie Wilsey, I'm with the city manager's office uh, and I am managing the project for the, the city of Reno. I'm joined with our by our consulting partners, Sarah Seelop and Ben Maloney, very Happy to have them here tonight as we enter this next phase of this process. Tonight, we're going to be releasing revised maps following the public input on uh, the preliminary map options that were released earlier this month in October. The three maps that we will be walking through tonight uh, meet the council adopted redistricting principles criteria. Uh, we revised them uh, using public input that we heard from many of you, and we thank you for joining us in this process. Um, and they will move forward for to council consideration on November 10th. Uh, so tonight, what we have in store for you uh, is a presentation that will just walk through kind of the requirements of this process and uh, a, a few of the steps, what led up to this point. We're gonna highlight some of the key issues we heard about during public comment over the last few weeks. We're gonna walk you through those three final map options and explain how you can give input to council on these maps before uh, heading into November 10th. Uh, just a few housekeeping items before we jump in. We are recording tonight's meeting and we'll be posting it on the city's online portal at reno.gov slash redistricting. That's where all the information uh, you can find about this process will be available there, including tonight's maps and information. So I encourage you to check that out. At the end of tonight's presentation, we will also be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Um, if you have initial thoughts on these preliminary maps, we will of course listen to them, but we will be more capturing uh, any feedback if you want to provide it tonight to make sure that we forward that on to the official council process. So again, thank you and let's go ahead and get started. So the Reno City Charter uh, really triggered this process for us. Uh, the charter is what uh, sets a lot of our requirements and how we operate at the city. And what it says is it requires us to update our ward boundaries if the, the census shows any ward exceeds the population in any other ward by more than 5%. And last year's 2020 census triggered that mark for us. So the process when we get to council uh, is this, the ward map must be changed through an ordinance and it will require a 5 7 vote. Earlier this year in July, the Reno City Council adopted a series of principles to kind of help guide this process and we've been using them throughout. Uh, so uh, we wanted to kind of talk about what are the musts in those principles and the shoulds. So the musts are really, we must be in compliance with all local, state and federal laws. Um, additionally, districts must be population balanced. The Reno City Charter allows for a 5% total deviation and variation in that population. And we'll talk a little bit more about that tonight. Districts must be contiguous or uh, touching uh, uh, parcels so we can't kind of pick all over uh, the, the city to kind of combine different neighborhoods. Districts must retain current council members. The city will solicit input from the community during this process and the 2020 census will be used as the data source. When we get into the shoulds about these principles, the district should be as compact as possible. Additionally, districts should preserve communities of interest. We're gonna talk about that tonight in terms of the feedback we heard around neighborhood integrity um, and the core of existing wards. Districts should also preserve uh, the use of existing boundaries. So one of the things I like to point out on this is there's multiple criteria, multiple 
perspectives, particularly as you get to the should level. Sometimes they'll be conflicting um, and we really are striving for balance, but we may not be able to accommodate everything all at once in the same map. And you're gonna see that tonight as we talk about some of these options. The redistricting process has really two key components for us. There's a very analytical side to make sure that we're meeting this criteria, as well as a, a really important outreach and engagement process uh, that you are taking part in tonight. So this process started with us collecting data from the census and starting to analyze it, but then we started to use those guiding principles to draft preliminary scenarios. There was four of them that we released in early October and asked the community for input. Uh, pretty much we are done with that revision process and we're heading into formal plan adoption. So as you, uh, what I wanted to note on, on this slide is we had those four preliminary maps, we asked for feedback, and then that has transitioned us into the three final maps. Um, if you want to see what that feedback uh, and input questions came from the public, that feedback log is available at reno.gov slash redistricting. So one of the important things that we wanted to talk to uh, everybody tonight is some of the key issues that were identified uh, through the public engagement uh, portion in the last few weeks on the preliminary maps, because these really help put what you'll see in the revised maps into context. So a few items really stood out to us as we reviewed what people sent in. Uh, Virginia Lake is definitely a, a point of conversation. Uh, we received multiple perspectives on this. Uh, in, in one way, uh, folks really identified Mo uh, uh, Virginia Lake as an area that is very core to Ward 2's identity. Um, and central and, and has a lot of relationships uh, and, and uh, neighborhood characteristics similar to the areas south of it, such as the Moana area and the Lake Ridge area. Um, we, heard once that we heard suggestions that we look at uh, growing Ward 3 into the Huffacre Rattlestake Mountain instead of moving Virginia Lake out of Ward 2. Um, on the other hand, we also heard from some folks that it makes sense to uh, uh, potentially adjust what Ward Virginia Lake is uh, in, to ensure that we, we balance the population. We know Ward 2 grew and uh, Ward 2 will be impacted by some of these changes. Um, and we need to be able to, and what we heard from the community uh, is that might make sense. And we need to be able to uh, accommodate for that, that growth. Um, when we talk about Wells Avenue and Lake Ridge, we heard some comments on this, uh, uh, both in that it's important not to break up these neighborhoods. In some of the preliminary options, some of the lines would have broken up these kind of neighborhoods of interest and in, in broken up the neighborhood in, into two separate wards. We heard comments that, that that was not desirable from the community. We also heard from on the university downtown area, the importance of maintaining the connection and cohesiveness between the downtown area and uh, UNR, particularly as students are starting to move into the downtown area. People felt that that was a neighborhood uh, that should uh, uh, be looked at cohesively. When we talk about Audie and Wells, uh, some of the, pro the pro preliminary proposals, excuse me, used Audi as a uh, line of delineation. And we heard from the community that this would really be breaking up a, a historical neighborhood. Um, uh, and so that would be not the preferred approach. Related to that, we heard that uh, this community of interest in this neighborhood in hopes in the future, if it can't be done uh, right now, would be really expanded to include uh, blocks around Evelyn Mount Northeast Community Center and kind of north to, to the McCarran uh, uh, Boulevard area. Um, there is also a section of East 4th Street that we heard about, uh, and the suggestion was to move this from Ward 5 to Ward 3 to create a more cohesive neighborhood uh, and provide connected services uh, throughout kind of the, the, the community of interest in that area. Um, there was two uh, areas, both in the one in the Northwest, the Mayan, Rob Drive, McCarran kind of block, as well as an area over on Skyline where folks had flagged that as an area that's often confusing for uh, voters and they don't know what war they are in because of existing lines. Uh, so uh, we also looked at those areas. So just wanted to kind of provide that summary and it, as it provides a little bit of context as we head into these revised maps. 
Um, so with that, I am going to turn it over to Sarah and Ben, who are going to walk us through these final map options. Hmm. All right, um, we move over to the, uh, the next slide. Excellent. Minimize this. All right, so first we'll just uh, take a quick look at the current configuration before we move on to the first scenario. Um, so ideal population that we're, we're trying to aim for in each of these wards after changing the configuration is 52,830. Uh, with the population growth over the past 10 years, uh, some of the wards have fallen out of balance. So we're looking at a total deviation from that ideal population of 20.9%. And as Kelly had already mentioned, uh, we're looking for a total deviation to be 5% or less. So there's a little bit of work to do coming into this uh, right away. Table at the bottom uh, shows the breakdown by ward uh, and the population of the ideal target, how far off it is. Uh, from that ideal population along with the percentage. So you see wards uh, four and five, um, yeah, their, their percent of ideal target is fairly low. So coming into it, there may not be a whole lot of touching of those two particular wards before. Um, uh, at initially, the initial thought was to maybe not touch those too much, but as you see, there were a few changes. Wards one, two, and three are where we see the biggest variation uh, when considering the ideal population, especially in ward two, where it is 7,376 people above uh, the ideal population or 14%. So tremendous growth happened over the past 10 years in ward two that we're all pretty well aware of. Uh, both ward one and ward three are roughly uh, 3,000 to 35 or 3,600 underneath. Um, so luckily, they are all fairly close to one another or uh, butting up against each other. So it makes it a little bit easier of a prospect to start making some changes um, between, especially those three. All right. So this is the overall map for scenario A. You see, uh, just starting off from the west, really some changes between Ward 1 and Ward 5 over closer to the west side of town. Um, a lot happening over by the university and the central business district, and then a larger change um, over by Rattlesnake um, over between wards two and three, but we'll go into a zoomed in view of some where some of these are taking place. In. Just the next slide. So this is uh, where a lot of these smaller changes took place in order to uh, reach, I guess, uh, you know, get to that ideal population, uh, some balance between the wards over here and uh, make things a little bit more compact and keep neighborhoods uh, that make sense in one ward within one ward. So we see some changes you know, happening around, um, again, the university over by the central business district or downtown, um, some of ward five going to ward three, even there over along fourth street. Okay. One of the smaller changes that took place uh, was over by uh, Moana and Plum, and I can't, pro can't pronounce that quite, <laughs> that name there, uh, with the K. Uh, Callie, if you can hop in and um, say what that I is. Know. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, a lot of that shifts over from, from Ward uh, 2 over to Ward 1, um, and a little bit of Ward 3 over there north of Moana over to Ward 1 also. Next slide. And this is where one of the, the bigger changes took place um, over by Rattlesnake, looking at South Meadows Parkway, Longley, or, um, and Double, Double R Boulevard, um, Ward 3, a, a good chunk of, well, a good chunk of Ward 2 so, uh, is transferred over to Ward 3 to help balance some of that population changes or pop, uh, get to that ideal population. And then one of the, the smallest ones is right there by Skyline uh, from a Ward 1 to a Ward 2 change right there, or Ward 2 to Ward 1. Um, this makes it a little bit less confusing for the residents uh, within that neighborhood. Um, makes it a little bit more contiguous, more compact for Ward One, and uh, brings that total deviation just a little bit, a little bit slight, a little bit lower. Uh, get closer, cl further away you can get from that five percent, uh, the better, or lower. And then uh, one of the other changes. This is a common one that was looked at uh, throughout most of the iterations of uh, of these scenarios. Um, over by you know, Rob Drive, Mayan, uh, McCarran and such. This all switches from Ward 5 to Ward 1. And this is primarily, we're looking at say those natural boundaries. Um, try to keep everything within those natural boundaries. So uh, Ward 1 in the previous or the current iteration uh, goes north of 80. Here we're moving it south, helps balance out the population. Also while keeping Ward 1 and Ward 5 
uh, more compact than they're currently um, situated. And then some of the summary statistics for scenario A. Um, so we some big shifts uh, over in uh, number one there. Most of them are, you're looking at underneath 1% um, deviation from ideal. Uh, the biggest one or biggest difference between all of those is probably Ward 4, where it's 1,208 people underneath the ideal population or 2.3%. And while that one does stand out compared to the rest of the wards in this uh, scenario, um, it's still well within that 5% uh, range that we're aiming for. Um, total population by race and ethnicity per uh, ward also. Um, no huge standouts right there. Um, a few different shifts, but we're not looking at big population shifts from ward, one ward to the next. All right, next one. All right, and with this one, uh, Sarah will take uh, scenario B before I join back in for scenario C. Great. Excellent. Thanks very much, Ben, for that uh, very thorough breakdown. So as you can see on this map, uh, kind of at a global level, uh, the hash marks indicate where so there's been some movement uh, from ward to ward, um, relatively small changes here and there. Can we have the next slide, please? Great. So zooming in just a little more, here's that downtown university area. Um, and so what you see here is the purple ward five, um, moving over to um, Ward 3 in the green, right, using kind of Wells uh, Avenue as a border to the, as a boundary to the east. Um, and it looks like um, we've, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm losing track of what the major road is, but using one of the, uh, the, the major arterials um, as a, also as a boundary uh, to the east. And uh, you can also see that another part of Ward 5, the purple, um, has moved over to Ward 1, the blue, uh, with California Avenue um, kind of as a southern boundary and, um, and center, North Center Street um, as the dividing line there uh, between Wards 1 and, uh, and Ward 3. And then finally, um, you can also see that there's been a little bit of a shift up around using Evans Avenue, um, just south of McCarran as a, um, as a dividing line, um, and that's moving from Ward 5 in the purple to um, Ward 4 in the gold. So next, uh, next slide, please. So we had some movement up around that, that university area. Um, here we are around the Virginia Lake area. This, um, th this option, option B, would move uh, a piece of Ward 2 around the Virginia Lake neighborhood to Ward 1, so effectively bringing the boundaries of Ward 1 down south um, and using West Moana Lane um, and, and Plumas as uh, some of the guidelines uh, for that with Skyline Boulevard to the west um, as the natural boundary there. Next slide, please. Great. Um, so similar, but uh, not identical to what you saw in scenario A. Um, here is a, uh, a piece of Ward 2 kind of bound here with um, East Moana Lane and um, north of McCarran moving uh, and, and moving different parts of this to uh, board three in the green, right? So that Southern portion, um, just North of McCarran uh, using, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, I'm losing the, uh, uh, the, the Eastern boundary, uh, the name of the Eastern boundary, but using 395 um, as the Western boundary and East Moana Lane as the Northern. You can see that part of that, uh, what was orange becomes green, moves over to ward three. And then in addition, we've got um, some changes from Ward 2 to, to Ward 1, right? So north of West and East Moana Lane um, and uh, with, with East Plum Lane as kind of the northern boundary, there's a, uh, there's a bit of a transfer there. Next slide, please. Great, thank you. Um, so here, this is, uh, I think, pretty uh, easy to see this little triangle um, south of McCarran um, is moving from Ward five, or excuse me, Ward three in the green to uh, to Ward two in the orange. So adding a little bit to Ward two in that scenario to balance out population. Um, next slide, please. And then um, finally, this uh, this piece here with Skyline Boulevard would effectively um, extend Ward two a little further to the west. So you can see that what was part of Ward one in the blue becomes part of Ward two in the orange. Next slide, please. Great. And last but not least, this is the same as in scenario A, effectively extending the boundaries of Ward 5 in the purple uh, down to I-80 and um, incorporating that kind of Mayan Avenue um, section into Ward 5. 
So next slide, please. Great, so some summary statistics here. Um, the population deviation for this option was 3%. Um, so as you can see here in table one, right, there's everything is under 5%, um, hewing pretty close to the ideal population. Ward five has the, uh, the biggest deviation at 2.1%, but um, still well under that 5% threshold uh, designated by the city of Reno charter. Um, after performing statistical analyses, it's clear that scenario B meets standards for compactness. Uh, and then as you can see in table three, population by uh, race and ethnicity per ward, um, some shifts here, but not a huge uh, number of changes. So Ben, I'm gonna hand it back to you. Excellent, thank you very much. Uh, so scenario C uh, has the least amount of changes, so it'll go fairly quickly, but there's still some bigger ones to go over, um, especially as we get down to the, the, between, the differences between ward three and ward two, or the changes proposed in this scenario. All right, next slide, please. Uh, so this uh, uh, this particular scenario, we're looking at Skyline again, and then the area to the northwest of the golf course, uh, shifting from Ward 2 uh, to Ward 1 to help balance, again, the population uh, growth that's been happening in Ward 2 and grab some population um, to Ward 1. Next slide. Smaller change, again, this is a frequent one that pops up, but looking at that area between Plum and Moana, uh, shifting from Ward 3, for the most part, to Ward 1, and then a small, tiny portion going from Ward 3 to Ward 2, that make that a little bit more uh, contiguous and compact, closer to Moana. And this is where the bigger changes take place uh, within scenario C. You see, again, South McCarran and uh, along Neal Road, just to the northwest of Longley. That's shifting over from Ward 2 to Ward 3 and a little bit of Ward 3 to Ward 2 or 2 to 3. And then over by Rattlesnake, double, uh, our Boulevard, South Meadows, very similar to what we saw in Scenario A, just it makes it a little bit more expansive to help balance that population as we shift uh, population from Ward 2 into Ward 3. Next slide, please. All right, uh, summary statistics. Uh, you've noticed probably at the top of each of these slides, the total deviation. Scenario A was uh, 3.2, and then both scenarios C and B are a total deviation of 3%. And remember, we want to get that underneath 5%. So both of these, all three of these meet that criteria. Uh, if we're looking at ward by ward for scenario C, we see uh, ward three stands out a little bit. Uh, look, there's, a, there's always been one district that stands out among, or one ward that stands out amongst the others in all of these scenarios. Um, in this case, now it's Ward 3 with 2.1% above the ideal population or 1,108 people. Um, still well within that 5% range. Everything else uh, uh, keeps it underneath 1%. Um, and then total population by race, ethnic, race and ethnicity per uh, ward. Again, similar to the others, we're not seeing huge shifts since we're not taking big chunks of wards or uh, large, uh, fair, you know, fairly larger than what we've been doing. Uh, for these scenarios and assigning them to different wards. So we're not seeing big shifts uh, of one race or ethnicity from one ward to the next. So everything stays fairly similar uh, to what it is currently configured as. All right. Great, thanks very much, Ben. So just taking a quick look at the timeline, where we've been, where we are and where we're going. Um, so this is community meeting number three. We are presenting to you the final maps. Uh, these will move forward to a presentation to the City Council and introduction of an ordinance on November 10th, uh, followed by ordinance adoption on November 1st, at which point the data will go to the Washoe County Registrar. Um, Callie, I'd like to turn it back over to you to walk us through the um, directions for Q and, uh, excuse me, for uh, public comment. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Ben and Tara, for both walk for walking us through those scenarios. As a reminder for everybody, those maps are online at reno.gov slash redistricting along with all of those stats. So after tonight's meeting, you can definitely kind of take some time to absorb that information. So as Sarah mentioned on the timeline, this the next step in this process is really these maps are heading to Reno City Council on November 10th. This is uh, where we start the formal process. It's the first step in the ordinance process where an ordinance uh, will be introduced. 
Um, and so we want to just explain how you can provide public comment from uh, this point going forward. So you can view the maps, get the information you need at reno.gov slash redistricting. Starting tomorrow afternoon at Reno City Hall in the lobby, we will also have big uh, large format maps posted in the lobby if you want to come down and, and look at them in person uh, during normal business hours um, at, at Reno City Hall. We'll make those available all the way through November 10th if you want to swing by. Um, and if you want to share your comments on these three options, uh, there are several ways to do that that will uh, make sure that they get in the hands of uh, council members. So you can email redistricting at reno.gov and public comment at reno.gov. We also have an online form for public comment at reno.gov slash public comment. You can leave a voicemail at the number you see on your screen. You can also attend the city council meeting in person on November 10th and provide input there. So as we kind of transition to tonight, uh, uh, similar to last meeting, we know that this is a lot of information to absorb uh, and may take a little bit of time to kind of think through it or, or look on the website. Uh, though, just a reminder that all the information is available on the website, but we still wanted to provide an opportunity tonight. If you have initial thoughts, um, any feedback you have tonight will be captured so we can make sure we move those notes forward to council. Um, but if there are any kind of specific questions that we can factually answer, we are happy to do that as well. So uh, if you are on Zoom, you can raise your hand by dialing uh, uh, by I did that wrong. Uh, by Zoom, you can raise your hand. If you're on the phone, you can dial star nine. Uh, we will pull people in one by one to speak. We'll let you know when you're in the room and we'll prompt you to unmute yourself. If you're on Zoom, you just hit unmute. If you're on the phone, you hit star six. So why folks are uh, maybe considering uh, that, I just want to thank everybody uh, really for joining us and participating in, in this process the past few months. Uh, we really appreciate the engagement uh, that we received and we look forward uh, to uh, uh, kind of wrapping this up with the community. So let's uh, go to our uh, first person with a question. Hi, Janice, how are you? Hi, good, just verifying you can hear me. We can. Um, does this actually take into account type of dwelling or is this just a population shift that comes into factor? Ben, do you wanna go, Ben or Sarah, do you guys wanna address that? Uh, uh, Janice, the, the population counts are driven by the census, but Ben and Sarah can kind of address how that factors in from a density standpoint uh, when the census is completed. Yeah, uh, certainly. The, it's, it's primarily population-based. Uh, one of the musts is uh, to get that ideal population or deviation underneath 5%. So that is our primary concern when making these iterations is shifting population around. But that's not to say that say, the housing type uh, isn't factored in indirectly. I mean, it's not something that we're looking at, but you know, your more dense housing areas are going to shift population uh, more greatly than your less dense population uh, or blocks. Um, so that's that's usually an easier grab, but not necessarily something that we we make it a point to grab. Um, just depends on uh, how the ideal population is shaping up as we're making changes, um, and also to, uh, when we're considering communities of interest and keeping them as compact as possible. Um, these are all things uh, you know, that features in directly also um, into uh, the decision making process. Sarah, anything to add? No, Ben, I think you addressed it very well that the, uh, the communities of interest were that this is data that um, came in via the, the public feedback process um, and that helps inform uh, the way that the maps are drawn. Um, and communities of interest might, you know, would include things like a neighborhood or and a neighborhood might consist, for example, of mostly single family homes or a mix of single family and multifamily dwellings or maybe several multifamily buildings. Um, so it really just depends on how people articulate their community of interest and um, whether and how they submitted that during the, uh, the, the feedback process. Thanks, Janice. Department of IT, who is there another uh, person on the line who has a question? Hi, Noe, how are you? 
Hello, I am doing very well, thank you. Uh, just a quick comment or question, I should say. So uh, earlier in the presentation, uh, you had highlighted some of those key issues like with the Virginia Lakes, the Wells Avenue and all that. Uh, when you are sharing the information with the city council on the three options, are you all going to be also providing all of those specific feedbacks or is it very similar to how you're presenting it here? And also in terms of anyone that created any alternative maps, like, um, like we did the Nevadans Count Coalition, um, would that also be factored into the, the feedback that is being provided to the city council? Absolutely, no, great question, Noe, and thank you for asking that. Uh, so kind of two-pronged, uh, the, the way that I, I think I can address this one um, is that council will get the whole information. So on even on tonight's redistricting website, you will see a public input feedback log and that is all of the feedback that we have received and qu questions from the public, including uh, the, the map that you guys propose. And that will become a formal part of the record that goes forward to council on November 10th as well. So while we in a presentation way will provide a summary, that detailed information also goes directly to council for their consideration. You had another that part of the question, Thank you. but I no, 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 that, that, that was it. The, the, the second part was the those maps, and so you said that in the that record or the the feedback log, it's going to have it there that they would be able to review it as well. Yes. So you, you yes. answered it in answering the, the the feedback question. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. It next person. Hi Donna, how are you tonight? I, I think I'm here now. <laughs> I'm good, thank you. Um, I was gonna suggest that, like you run through all these things, they all look good. You've taken an awful lot of co people's comments and considerations about neighborhoods into account in these modifications, which I think you did a great job on that. Um, it's a little bit hard to, like you have the tables that show your compactness and the percentages per ward. And just as a visual thing, it would be helpful in this sort of situation anyway, if you had a wrap up slide where you've got the tables next to each other, like we've got, um, you know, so we can see, well, scenario A, B, and C, what is actually the difference of how that's sliding to being better and worse or not or something. And then also I had a little bit of difficulty in that the scale on your before and after pictures is not the same. So, the how it is now on the left was like bigger or you know it didn't show the same exact area at the same exact scale so it wasn't as easy to visually compare a to b do you understand what i mean i do yeah okay. thank you Donna, for that feedback so i'm just saying it, it would make it um, helpful for me as a member of the public to get a better visual clarity about exactly how these things compare I mean, you did a good job, I could tell. It wasn't like I couldn't work it out, but it's like, oh, wait a minute, you know, different scale, slide it back. So anyway, so. Thank you, appreciate it. IT, next person. I am not seeing any hands. Oh, never mind. One more. <laughs> Hi, Wanda, how are you this evening? Having a hard time because our internet down here is spotty, but I've been sending messages in the chat. Okay. Um, and, and I was looking at that, I see you added a lot into Ward 3, but I see there's a lot of new development down here that's happening on the Eastern half of veterans that might be better transferred than breaking up Double Diamond, which Double Diamond has so many different associations and so much handling to split that up would really make it difficult for the, the council members to be dealing with the issues. I, I'm in Ward 3, and I know we have issues, but at least we have a delineation of who is handling what issues, where start breaking up is going to become a real mess. Where everything on the east half of veterans is newer and could much easier, more easily be transferred into Ward 3 than Ward 2, and it would be a good divide. 
we use that reference? Do we have like Dean Loretto's new developments and all those new apartments and stuff? So that might be a better way to shift three down this way and then to cut it straight across and kind of do double by them. Okay, thanks so much for, yeah, thank you for sharing that feedback. You're, we're getting a little bit of an echo, so I would just say, Wanda, I'd encourage you to make sure to log that feedback uh, through those ways that we talked about to make sure it gets to council. I have the notes, though. IT notes for Oh, I think Wanda may have one another thing to say. Wanda, go ahead and unmute yourself. We were having trouble hearing you at the end. I see the lot of people in chat. Those questions are being answered. I will not do it, but scroll through. I okay. think one of the questions about the sixth ward was answered. Um, I think we've answered those questions. If if not, maybe somebody wants to pop in and ask their question, happy to answer it. IT, is there anybody else? Hi, can you hear me? Hi, Donna, yes. Hi, Donna Keith. Um, <clears throat> I was wondering if you could show a map of what of the area that Wanda was talking about so I can see what she's describing about double diamond versus the areas to the south I don't know which what map that might be on but can you put one of your uh one of your maps back up sure Wanda if you could stay on the line and maybe describe that um the only problem that I will say Donna and Wanda and for everybody out there is um I'll put up one of of the maps, but Wanda, you'll have to kind of describe it a little bit because we won't have a close up in the PowerPoint of potentially the area you're talking about. But let me let me see if I can get there. I'm thinking maybe this is the area you're talking about. Oh. Okay, so what she's talking about is where you took um, Double R Boulevard, that whole section out of Ward Two and gave it to Ward 3. And I think what she's saying is, instead of doing that, take more stuff from the south of Double Diamond and move that into Ward 3 so that you don't split double R. That would be my understanding of what I heard as well. So where does this, do you have any pictures of a map that goes farther south to the end of this Ward 2? Like even just the original map so we can see the whole long of it? Yeah, like that. Yeah. So then, what I think she's saying, the striped area that went into Ward Three, she's saying keep that in Ward Two and move some of this other stuff to this that's on the southeast extension. Move that instead into Ward Three. Is is would I be understanding that correctly? So great feedback for both of you, Donna and Wanda. Um, I would just uh, ask you guys to uh, Wanda maybe submit that for the record so we can confirm that, that that's what you're asking for. IT, we have the next person, please. Hey, it's uh, David Pritchett. It looks like I'm up. Hi, David, how are you? Well, I'm, I'm still seeing the conundrum or undemocratic uh, outcome like I've asked before. So I put in two pointed questions in the chat. Okay. Um, so I'll read one. Um, okay. So if an incumbent council member had only six months left on her third and final term, would the ward configurations now in this plan still have to accommodate and be anchored by the residential location of that same termed out council member. So the, the reason that this is one of the principles is both the city charter and state law say that an elected official has to serve 
uh, to be actively living in the area in which they serve. And so when the map would switch and become take an effect, if, if the person was drawn out, uh, essentially they would no longer be serving uh, and could not serve in the role in which the voters elected them to previously. That is why that's there. So even under your scenario, yes. So let me go back to the 2024 scenario that really is what holds more interest for a chance of major change. Um, remind us then of the schedule. So um, what is the intention now for the war in relation to the um, November election in 2024? So when, when will those new wards be approved versus in effect in 2024? So the city charter says when uh, it says January 1st of 2024 is when the city uh, is scheduled to go to six wards. So it would need to be in place then uh, for the 2024 election. We would anticipate doing a process similar to this, uh, uh, probably uh, with additional time uh, involved in it uh, in 2023 to prepare for that. Um, so what you're, so my scenario, what you're concluding is if a, um, if an incumbent were still seated after November, 2024, because that term say expires in 2026, then the new ward then still must accommodate that residence of that incumbent. Correct. If I'm understanding correctly, it's a, little, it's a little thick. Yeah. If I'm understanding correctly, I believe that's the case unless the uh, redistricting principles or state law or the charter were to change. Yeah. Well, what I'm getting at from a public perspective is um, the the rewording now and especially in 2024 will be to accommodate council members who are not going to be there more than a couple more years, and yet the ward configuration will last when, seven or eight years after that point? That's, that's the problem. And, and we're, not, we're not really, we don't really have an opportunity to reconfigure everything for communities of interest or on, uh, unrepresented minority communities, et cetera, um, as long as these anchor points of the current incumbent residences are driving the boundaries. That's the problem. And this, these maps now, I mean, are great exercises in, in census block populations, adding and subtracting, but they're, they're just nibbling around the edges of potential change. That's the conundrum here. Thanks, David. Appreciate the feedback. Department of IT, who else? IT, do we have anybody else left on the line with any questions? Not that I'm seeing. I was giving you a little bit of time. Okay. Well, again, why we give one more second uh, uh, for anybody to ask these questions. Just really wanted, again, to thank everybody for the participation thus far. Um, oh, we have another person. Dean. Is it Jazz? Yes, it's Jazz. Thank you Thanks, so Jazz. much, Callie, for leading this effort. Um, I just wanted to clarify that when we have these final app map options provided, is it going to be a vote to the city council um, to choose which maps, or is there still room to um, to kind of discuss like what the map lines will be drawn as? Sure. So between now and council, these will be the final maps that go. But on November 10th, council could provide various direction, including 
uh, not limited to uh, requesting changes, or they could select one of these maps as well. Okay, got it. Thank you for the clarification and thank you for your work on this. I really appreciate it. And I know the community does too. Thank you. All right, anybody else? Okay, well, I just wanna again, thank everybody. I hope you all have a great evening. Uh, again, head to reno.gov slash redistricting for these maps. Uh, and we also have the information about ways to provide public comment on that site. So you can easily capture it and send in your comments to the Reno City Council. We appreciate it. We hope you all have a great evening. Thanks so much.